We are going to get started shortly. Um, once, yep, we are recording. So this will get recorded and um, the deck will get sent out to everyone. So, you know, you can take notes if you want, but like, don't feel any pressure that you need to. Um, the content will be shared back out with you guys. Um, just some logistics. Uh, we don't have a Q&A section. We do have a chat function, which some of you guys are well, more than welcome to use to introduce yourselves. Um, it's really cool that we have people from basically all over the country as well as all over the world. Um, and that y'all chose to spend part of your Sunday afternoon or Sunday morning, wherever you might be, um, listening to me ramble about photography lighting. But, um, you know, just, so I guess we'll just get, jump right into it. Um, you know, thank you guys so much for joining. Uh, my name is Justin. Uh, that's my Instagram. I've been doing photography for about seven years now, um, primarily in doing like weddings and portraiture. So if either of those topics are things that you are interested in learning more about. Um, you know, feel free to ask as many questions as you want, even if they're not lighting related. Um, not that it matters, but I shoot primarily with Nikon gear. Um, I started out on like the old school D700s, then upgraded to like the D750s, and now I shoot um, full mirrorless with the Z6s. Um, cool, cool, cool. Welcome, Chris. Landscape photography. See, everyone who does landscape photography, I'm always like super impressed by because I don't have the patience to like hike 10 miles to go take pictures of trees. Uh, just not my thing. But um, anyways, back to this. Uh, one really quick thing is I know that we're going to be talking about a lot of different concepts today. Um, I'm not an expert at any of these things. These are just kinds of um, like my experience when it comes to lighting, um, you know, and so the most important thing, and here's some samples of my work um, because the shameless plug, but um, the most important thing is like when we were creating this workshop, some of you guys may have been at my workshop last two weeks ago with Sean about portrait photography. Um, this workshop is going to be a little bit more on the technical side, a little bit more on kind of geared towards more intermediate photographers. Um, you know, like if, um, but what that means is that, you know, if at any point, like, you know, please do use the chat function to throw in questions. Um, this is something that we are all learning together. And these are just kinds of like things that I've learned over time uh, and picked up. Um, if you guys like what you guys are hearing today, if you guys like this workshop, if you hate this workshop and you think that I'm really annoying and you never want us to do it again, um, either way, you should buy ACN some coffee because um, it's only because you know of them coordinating things like this that we are able to do events like this. Um, like I said, the uh, link to the, or sorry, the deck will get sent out later, so you don't have to write down this link right now. Um, but yeah, send them a cup of coffee, um, support kind of what they're doing. I think it's awesome that, you know, when, when I was first starting out, I had to learn from basically just reading things on the internet and there really weren't very many people who looked like me that I could ask. Um, so I think it's really cool that ACN exists. Um, and, and yeah, anyways, moving on. Um, just as a quick like agenda, um, today, you know, I, I was, when, when I was trying to sit down to kind of create this workshop in the first draft of the workshop, um, in the first run through of the workshop, basically I realized that it was, pretty like lighting is a really broad set of topics. Um, and so to pick and choose the two topics that I did want to share with you guys um, was challenging, but I picked two that I think are really important that I think if you can really master these two concepts, then it will really upgrade like a lot of your photography. It's stuff that I'm consistently working on. Um, but these are also like the two that I use most frequently for pretty much everything. Uh, we're going to have uh, the bulk of the workshop is going to be an audience participation section. So we're going to use the chat. Um, you know, and I think that that's the best way to learn lighting is to just go through different lighting scenarios and to just do it. Um, and that way you'll kind of see the way that I think about lighting as well as we can all learn together. Um, and then in the third part portion, uh, we'll do Q and A on any of the topics that we had um, covered today, as well as um, some of you submitted questions when you fill out the survey. And so we'll cover um, a few of those topics as well, um, if that makes sense. If you guys have any questions along the way, please don't hesitate to pop them into the chat. Um, I or the other Justin who is um, on the ACN Zoom account will be monitoring that for sure. So even if I don't answer your question right away, we're definitely going to try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, and we'll just go from there. So without any kind of like further ado, um, let's just jump straight into it. Um, you know, I, I, you know I, I think that lighting is one of these topics that you know, when you, when you talk about photography, people think about like, oh, you have composition, you have like posing, you have what gear to buy. 
But like lighting is a whole other set of things that can get very complicated very quickly. Um, and so hope, my hope um, for today's like discussion is to, you know, cover a few core concepts and then teach us all as a group to kind of figure out how to look at an image, critically think about how light is interacting in that image, and then most importantly, break it down so that you could figure out how to recreate the image yourself. Um, because I think that that's kind of um, a very, and this will be a common theme of the workshop, but this is a very like important toolkit, I think, when developing yourself and your photography, is when you look at work around you uh, that inspires you, that you are inspired by, to realize that, you know, like, I think it's easy to look at billboards and be like, oh my God, I could never do photography like that. Uh, but when you can demystify and break down certain things, um, like the lighting scenarios, it actually makes it a lot more approachable. And you'll realize how much you actually do have access to and how much you can do, um, given the right tools and given the right knowledge. Um, and I apologize if I start going a little too fast, I have a tendency to talk a little too quickly. Um, so someone just let me know if um, I start rambling too much and you want me to slow down. Um, but just as a quick warning, like there will be a little bit of science um, in this presentation, not that much, um, but some of it is just kind of inescapable that, you know, when you're talking about light, you're gonna have some physics in it. And I think it's fun, but y'all may not, but either way, we're gonna cover it. But anyways, so the first topic that I wanted to cover with everyone is this idea of like big light versus small light and like hard light versus soft light. Um, I think that these are terms that get thrown around by photographers all the time without necessarily people knowing like what that means. Um, I'm sure if I asked, um, most of you guys have probably heard these terms before, but um, they're kind of just analogs for saying the same thing. So if you look at the diagram on the left, this would be an example of like, if, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse or not. Can someone give me a quick like yes, no, if you can see my mouse? Yeah. Yes, awesome, cool, cool. So the gray circle is our subject and the yellow is our light source. And what you can see is like the beams of light and then the shadow that it creates. I wasn't the one who made the diagram, so I don't quite know why they chose the lit portion of the thing to be black and the dark portion of it to be white, but it is what it is. Um, when you think about the size of your light sources, so this is like the first topic that we're gonna cover, cover is like, right? Like the size of your light source in relation to your subject is what determines whether or not like it's hard light or soft light. So when you look at this first diagram on the left with our light source being smaller than our subject, it creates a very hard shadow. So that's what we mean by like hard light and like small light sources. In contrast, on the left hand, on the right hand side, when you have a much larger lighting surface in, in relation to your subject, you not only have light that's like lighting your subject, you also have light that's filling in the shadow. And that's what creates softer shadows. Does that make sense? And I'm gonna slow down and like kind of just leave this diagram up for a little bit to help you guys kind of think about that. So when you're thinking about lighting, the first thing is you have your subject and then you have like your light source. And then we don't always think about the shadows and things like that, but even things like the shadows under their noses or the shadow under their chin, for those of you who do portrait work, um, or for those of you who do like macro work, if you're doing like taking photographs of drinks or rings or food, um, the softness of the shadow is gonna be determined by the source of uh, light that is you know, lighting your thing. So this is why, for those of you who may have like watched food photography like tutorials, the first thing that they teach you is put your food next to the window, right? Like get it as close to the window so you have the soft indirect light coming from inside. But also by moving your food closer to the window, you increase the size. If you imagine your window is your light source, you increase the size of your light source in relation to your subject so you soften the shadows on the other side of the food, right? So that's like how you'd apply it to like food photography. Um, product photography is oftentimes the same thing. Right? When you want nice, even lighting, you need a really big light source in relation to your subject. Uh, most of the time when you're shooting portraits, with few exceptions, like people are normally trying to go for softer lighting. Uh, it tends to be more flattering on the face. It also, because you're not creating hard shadows across the face, like if you imagine I just shown a flashlight across my face right now, like you would create a really unsightly shadow because of the nose. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that you wanna be thinking about when you're looking at your lighting setups. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, 
And yeah, if at any point anyone has any questions, just like jump right into it. So that's like the first lighting concept that I wanted to share with you guys. It's relatively intuitive. Um, it's not super, I think it's one of those things that like you look at this and you're like, well, duh. But also creating the habit that when you're shooting to incorporate these ideas of like, do you have hard light or soft light in your scene? So the one exception to this rule that I'll share with you guys as like a guideline is that the sun, like bright sun, you treat it like a saw small and hard light source, even though the sun is really large. Um, so for those of you who like to shoot outdoors and like to shoot portraits outdoors, um, and you're thinking about the, the size of your light sources, and you're thinking about like, is, does the sun count as a hard light source or a soft light source? Um, most of the time it counts as a hard light source, unless you have clouds, which are God's soft box, because then it diffuses everything and that's what creates soft shadows. Um, but that's jumping a few steps. The next concept that I wanted to cover with everyone is the inverse square law. And I promise this is the last mathy, physics-y thing here. Um, it's basically, you know, you guys are gonna read the text on the screen, but if you imagine this diagram and you ignore the numbers, but like if you have a pin, um, like a spherical source of light, um, the important thing to realize is that the strength of your light source um, and the intensity on your subject decreases exponentially with every linear change in distance. Um, this is another one that especially for those of you who are interested in learning about off-camera flash um, and you're thinking about balancing multiple light sources in your scene, um, this is going to be a very important thing uh, that confuses a lot of photographers. This is something that confuses photographers who have been shooting for like 15 years. I regularly hear people use this law incorrectly. Um, so if you guys have questions on this, like ask them, and that's fine. And, and you, you know, don't feel bad if this is a weird thing to learn and read about. Um, but the reason I share this rule is because understanding that the distance will change the intensity of the light by four every time you have the distance um, and so on um, is really important because you can very quickly therefore manage the light sources in your scene by moving the relative positions of your subject and the light sources so you know for those of you who might have like started watching youtube videos about how to do the really really like they like create perfect black like black backgrounds and oftentimes a way to do that is to move your subject off of the background more and get them closer to the light so that the relative position of the subject and the light source is far is, is you know the, the, the subject is closer to the light source in relation to the backdrop so lighting them means that you lose a lot of the light on the background and that's how you create like super black backgrounds without necessarily needing a black backdrop or um, lighting your background in an unsightly way um, but that's the inverse square law I don't have much more to say about it other than that it's important and it's something that you're going to hear over and over um, and that these are like so this and the rule previously are kind of like the two key concepts that we're going to be discussing um, or thinking about uh, when it comes to hey Sean um, when it comes towards like discussing lighting on our images so with that um, we're going to jump straight into the audience interaction section um, because I think that the best way to understand these concepts is to just discuss them. You'll also get a chance to kind of see in real, like in a real lighting situation, how I approach it, how I think about lighting it, um, and hopefully cover, like fill out the rest of kind of the knowledge that we're gaining together on lighting. So the way we're gonna do this is um, we're gonna have, I'm gonna show you guys an image and I want everyone to kind of think about like, where's the light coming from? How many sources of light do we have? Um, and then try to break down the image to think about like, if you were to go out and recreate this image, how would you shoot that? Um, this is like an exercise that I do with clients all the time. I'll give you guys an example later on, but um, I think that we'll be able to do this together. And so we're gonna use the chat for it. So um, if you guys don't know how to use the chat, I don't know how to help you. Um, but I hope that everyone knows how to use the chat. If you don't, we can always unmute and like raise hand unmute and whatnot if people really like want to do that instead. Um, you know, so we don't have to always do everything in relation to the two rules that we've discussed earlier. We kind of just really wanted to share more about um, 
like the different light uh, situations that we're going to go into, and then how we could have lit them, and like how to understand it, and then break down the image. So with that, like we're going to start with this first image, which is a portrait that I did, um, and you know, so I'm just going to leave this up for like a minute or two, let you guys think about how I might have lit it, um, think about where the sources of light are coming from, and then think about like if you were to recreate this image, like how would you do it? Um, and so I'm going to start rambling now and let you guys kind of think about the image and think about how you might light and create a similar image. Cool. So I'm seeing some people starting to like throw guesses into the chat, which I love. Um, you know, everyone keep going for it. Um, think about it. Cool. So yeah. So uh, Christine, you kind of hit it. You hit it exactly on the nail. So this was shot with one light, with the sun right behind her, with the reflector filling in the shadow. So depending on who you're talking to, you might call the sun your primary light source. I would call the reflector my primary light source in this case. Um, a, a pro tip, just for you know, if you guys are trying to think about and looking at other people's images and trying to figure out how to break down the lighting, uh, look at their eyes because it'll reflect back whatever light sources are facing them. So you actually can see um, like what the highlights are. And it also creates a catch light. Um, and check out their catch lights like that. So yeah, this, this photograph was done, I think it was like around sunset. So the sun is basically right behind her, um, right behind her head. So it acts as my backlight. And I'm exposing for her face with the reflector um, and using the white side of my reflector to basically fill in the shadow on the left-hand side. and by doing so, you know, I blow out my background because the sun is really strong. But by keeping the reflector really close to her face, I think it's like right out of frame. Uh, I'm able to light her sufficiently enough that with a little bit of editing, I don't completely lose my background. Um, but that's, yeah, so this is an example of, um, so for those of you who had questions about how to deal with, um, you know, outdoor lighting situations, this is a very common setup that I use, uh, especially when I'm shooting in less than ideal light. Um, you know, because as much fun as golden hour is, I think golden hour is also like very harsh can be sometimes. So my favorite thing to do is to put the sun behind them and just light them with a reflector um, and therefore get images like this. Cool. So moving on, we're going to look at this image, which is an image that I shot at a wedding. Obviously, this is really different, um, but same thing. So tell me about, you know, where do you guys think the light is coming from? Um, what are our different sources of light that we have to be thinking about when we're lighting this image? Um, and then if you were to create a similar image, uh, what would you do? So let's just start by someone start naming the different light sources in the scene. Just like throw out whatever. Cool, cool. Love it, love it. Yes, there are outdoor lamps, there are indoor lights. Uh, the tungsten from behind her, love it. Okay, Sean's going into the, the color balance, which is definitely something to be thinking about. The lamps, okay, cool, yes. Um, love it. So yes, you guys are all right that those are the lights in our scene. Um, there's also, yes, there is a flash on my camera. Um, so there's a couple concepts that we can break down looking at this image. Um, 
so let me think. Uh, yes. So you guys are all right that. Yeah. So so that's yeah, Sean, I, I would have loved to have turned off the lights if I could. It's not up to me, uh, not my venue. Uh, um, but so the way this image was shot was I had one light on my camera um, that I flashed up and behind me um, onto the ceiling of the outdoor patio area that we fortunately had. Um, and using that as my primary light to light her, because she is my main subject in this, um, bouncing the light off the ceiling onto my subjects. Now, yeah, so so one thing that was mentioned here that I think is worth discussing as well, um, Sean mentioned the tungsten from behind her as well as way behind her over here. Um, this is gonna be a common issue that when you guys are running into artificial light or when you move into blended light scenarios, um, where you have this choice where the color temperature of your different lighting sources are different and you then have to match um, or you have to try matching any additional light that you add to the scene by using gels. So if these are things that are like, are ringing any bells for you guys or things are, these are things that you may have heard of beforehand, um, that's what they're referring to. Um, for those of you who aren't necessarily as familiar with these ideas, basically, you know, if I have my flash on my camera, my flash on my camera is daylight balanced, meaning the light that comes out is like white, um, whereas indoor lamps and like tungsten lamps in the very far back do not emit perfectly white light. Um, their light is shifted more towards the orange end of the spectrum. Um, so sometimes what you have to do is you then have to gel your flash or you have to gel your lights to match the indoor lighting um, just a little bit so that your lighting is more consistent across your scene. Um, and that's something that a lot of event photographers oftentimes have to deal with. Um, and some people just ignore it and don't do it anyways, but like that is something that you wanna be thinking about as well. Um, great, but yes, so you know, when you're thinking about like interesting lighting scenarios like this, I'm functionally not really worrying too much. Um, yeah, so it's okay, yeah, great question, Sean. So um, gel filters, they are basically, let me see, do I even, I don't know where they are right now because they're all in my moving boxes. But basically, like, you know, when I put a flash on my camera, which I can discuss. Actually, hold on. Get on here. I'll be right back. We can tell that I, you know, so in my defense, I just moved yesterday. So I literally don't know where half the things are in my apartment. Um, but yes, so. When I have camera on my fl or flash on my camera like this, um, where's my? Okay. So flash on my camera. This is a very common like event photographers. This is a pretty like thing that like you guys are all very used to seeing, right? So I'm pointing the flash basically behind me and like above and behind me to light on the ceiling, bouncing the flash. And this is something that we'll cover again in a little more detail later, in case that's something people are still curious about. Um, but yes, so the flash, the filters will go on top of my flash. Um, there are different ways of doing this. There are a lot of different kits. Um, if you guys have seen like people talk about Magmod, Magmod is a really popular brand um, for like magnetic gel filters that just clap onto the top. Um, but yes, so that's why is that you can add and color the light. Um, those of you who do any kind of cinematography or do like video work, um, this is something that you'll be very familiar with. Or if you used to work in the theater, um, this is something that they're very, very familiar with. Um, and that's like a very common concept there. Um, cool. So a couple more images. Um, for this image right here, same thing. So this is obviously a different image. Um, but for all y'all like macro product photographers, um, help me break down this image. Um, tell me a little bit about how you think I shot it um, and tell me a little bit about how you would recreate it. <laughs> so describe the light do we have 
you know, what kind of light do we have on the, on the, the ring? So we, we consider it hard light, soft light. Um, think about the, si the size of our light sources in relation to our objects. Do we think that they're bigger than the rings, smaller than the rings? Um, Small light bouncing off the ring. Cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Any other guesses? Yep, these are all great answers. Love it. Cool. So I actually went back to this wedding um, and then found um, a behind the scenes image of this so that I can actually break down the lighting, uh, which was great. I'm actually glad that I found this. So you guys are all very close. You guys are all very close, but you're right. So, so Jeffrey, you're right that there are two light sources coming in from the side, lighting either side of the ring. Um, so here, here's the, the source. So basically I had two LED panels that are on either side of the ring um, that I just didn't perfectly center. And that's just what happens when you're in a rush. I'm actually for this image laying on the floor. Um, this is the hardwood floor of the dance floor that the venue had. Um, it was slightly reflective in a kind of dirty way, which is what created the kind of hazy reflection on the bottom there. Um, I've done a similar shot like this with, um, um, using my cell phone as a glossy like thing to reflect the rings off of. But so there's a couple key concepts that I want to cover with this image, right? So thinking about big versus small, hard versus soft. So I didn't want to have completely hard light on the rings, right? So that's why I used light sources that were larger than the rings to fill in the shadows underneath. And that's how you know, we can actually see the outline of all the rings and all that stuff. Um, because if our light sources were too small, uh, my rings wouldn't be properly lit. Um, you know, for any of you who are interested in wedding photography, um, you know, or interested in product photography, uh, people are spending a lot of money on certain objects during their day and they want it to be captured well. Um, and so being able to have a couple lighting setups like this in your back pocket can be really great. Um, you know, because this is, you know, they, they, that's probably at least 25 grand of ring and stone there. Like, you know, the least you can do is learn how to light it properly. But so a couple of key concepts. First one was big versus small. So I made sure to use LED panels that were larger than the rings instead of using like flashlights. I've done a similar shot like this by using two phone, two phone, like, like using the LED lights on a phone. Um, but I found that to be too harsh. And so I stopped doing that and I went and bought these LED panels. Um, by keeping them really, really close to the ring. Now, so think back to inverse square law. There's actually three light sources in this image, even though we only see two LED panels, because you have the room lights, because the room lights are on right now, because this is literally right in the middle of dinner. Um, that's usually when I do my ring shots, is right in the middle of dinner. But so the only way we start, we, like we can't tell them to turn off all the lights in the venue, but we still wanna use this floor so that what we can do is by managing the relative distance, right? And putting the LED panels really, really close to the rings, they become the dominant light source in our scene. Because by turning up the LED like lights to whatever, my entire image would be completely blown out unless I like stop down my camera. So if you guys think about like exposure triangle, you have aperture, ISO, and shutter speed. So, discounting away our flash, right? You can take your aperture ISO and shutter speed, manipulate the numbers such that you create a really, really dark scene by intentionally underexposing the ambient light, in this case, the room lights in your scene, you can create like a functionally black image. So I think this shot was probably done with a macro lens at like F11. Um, and then because 
I was using like artificial lights. I think it was like one over 200 F 11, like ISO, like 200, which for anyone who does like event work, you realize that this is like really, really like you would use those kinds of setting in broad daylight. But by keeping the LEDs so close to it, I'm able to light the scene while blacking out the rest of the image. And so this is like a really good example of how we can use something like the inverse square law to our advantage to light these rings. That makes sense. Cool. So oftentimes when you're using artificial lighting, um, for those of you who are starting to integrate like off-camera flash, um, like LCD panels, stuff like that, um, this is something that you want to be thinking about is the relation, the relationship of like, you know, the, the lights that you're adding to the scene with the lights that already exist in the scene. Cool. So I like this image because it like does a lot of different things for this workshop. So here's another wedding photo. Same thing. Let's talk about how this was lit. Let's talk about, you know, tell me about this image. What do you guys think? Uh, Jinhan, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by, oh. Yeah, okay, so I'm getting some questions about this. Cool, cool, cool. So, so Jinhan, I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean by where is the daylight. Um, in this case, we're indoors, we're in like the venue, and this is just the dance floor that was right in the middle of the, the banquet hall. So there isn't daylight, but what I meant earlier is that a lot of like flashes with no modifications are balanced. So their color temperature is balanced to be daylight white. No, I mean, cause, sorry, I just, I'm um, really no, Go for it, go for it. Um, cause you said there are like three actual light sources in yep. this photo, but we only see two. I was wondering where the other one is. The room lights are the third one. Where is it? Cause it looks oh, dark. It's not, it's not in the image. I just mean that like this room is like completely bright right now. Like this, this scene, even though it looks completely black, like all the lights in the room are on technically. Interesting. Yeah. So by manipulating my aperture and ISO, to stop down my aperture as well as decrease the sensitivity of my camera to the ambient light, I'm basically able to create a really, really dark shadow by anything that's not lit by the LED panels. Cool, thank you. Yeah, of course. No, great, I love, I love these questions. Um, the LEDs, so, it, so yeah, so, so Jeffrey, I hope that answers your question. This was not shot in complete darkness. This was shot at a relatively regularly lit, um, banquet hall, you know, you just think about like a, you know, your standard hotel banquet ballroom that has standard lighting. Yeah. Uh, and so to give you guys like another, another reason why you might do something like this, if we go back to this image, like, let's say we had a lot of different mixed lighting sources and I really, really hated the lighting back here. And I really didn't want to show any of the, the background, right? I could technically using, uh, you know, I could just bring my shutter speed really, really high and reduce the effect that the ambient light has and just increase the power of my flash, which I know will provide good lighting onto her face and then darken the rest of my ambient. That's like a, a choice that you can make. Um, if, for example, you're in mixed lighting situations that are really, really terrible. You can just, by manipulating the exposure triangle, right, like kill the ambient or like reduce the effect that the ambient light will have on your image while only caring about like my flash, which is lighting her, right? Being able to do that. If you shoot in complete darkness with the two LED panels, um, probably, um, you know, if I was able to turn off the, all the room lights and I was only able to light this image with two LED panels, it would look the same, you're right, because it would just be completely dark. Um, it was more that because I was at, because they were like guests in the room, um, I'm not able to ask the venue staff to turn off all the lights for me to get, so for the, like, you know, like just imagine your wedding photographer asks like, can we turn off all the lights so I can lay down on the hardwood floor and take a picture of these rings? Like people are gonna start looking at you crazy um, or they're like just gonna be confused or we just don't wanna always be, we wanna be minimally disruptive to the day. So we just, you know, are able to get the same effect without having to, um, you know, turn off any lights. So third image, and this is the last one. This is the last one. Um, so talk to me about this one. Sean's guessing LED panels from the corners. Cool, cool. Any other guesses? Yep. 
yeah, the DJ booth did have that really obnoxious light, like right in the center there, as well as this venue just having like really, really obnoxious up lighting, which is why it's so purple. But you know, some people love that. They loved it. There is a spotlight from straight above. Love it. Yes. There are shadows on both sides of the couple. Yeah. I love it. So you guys are definitely picking up on. You can determine the size of the light source by looking at the shadows that the different light sources create. Um, and that's a really key skill. Yeah. So you know that because there's a shadow here and there's a shadow here and it's a relatively hard defined silhouette, right? That Basically, camera right and left, I had two flashes on stands pointed directly at them with a slight downward tilt. Um, there is a spotlight right above them that is also lighting them. So the purpose of my flashes was really more to fill in the shadows underneath their chin, underneath their um, cheekbones, right? Because there was a spotlight from right above. So tell me you guys about this scene, right? So basically, you go to like a wedding venue, and a lot of the times they'll have spotlights, because that's a thing that they have nowadays. Um, and they have like environmental back like up lighting and stuff like that. So for my for oftentimes for weddings, I'll set up like one or two flashes on either side to light them as they do their first dance, just so I can get clean lighting on them. But like, I'm not going to put massive modifiers to diffuse the light, because that would become like disruptive and hard to do for frankly. Um, and so I make do with two small lights on either side. But you can see the difference between like this image and the ring image is that here I'm actually wanting to integrate um, the environmental light, right? Because I wanted to highlight the, the up lighting of the venue as well as make it not like a completely dark image um, to show kind of more of the environment during their first dance. Um, so this is a scenario where I'm not, I'm trying to use the flash to fill in the shadows, to kind of accent and highlight and kind of fix some of the issues with the previous existing lighting. Yeah, so great question. How am I rigging up the lights on the side? So um, remotes and triggers, right? So the flashes that I use can be wirelessly triggered um, via a commander that I put onto, my, and onto the top of my camera. Um, and if that means nothing to anyone, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, I will link and share with you guys some resources at the end of this that will have lots of information about those of you who are interested in incorporating off-camera flash. Um, that's definitely like a topic in and of its own. I will also have like gear that you guys can look into um, if you're trying to do this cheaply and on a budget. Um, so don't worry. We're definitely going to get there. So yeah. So there's two, maybe three lights um, because I had two on the side and I, were, if think, I think I remember there being a spotlight up above because that's why I set set up the lights on the side because sometimes they, they do it well enough where they, the light is nice enough already and you don't need to add additional lighting. Um, but I didn't, because the spotlight was right above them, I wanted to fill in the shadows underneath their cheek um, because otherwise, and you can tell from here, if you look at like underneath her eye, that the primary light, which is the spotlight above her, is creating these shadows and it just is what it is. Uh, sometimes you can't fix bad lighting. You can just make the best of it as, as, um, as you can. Cool. Um, so this exercise that we've been going through is um, something that I think you should just keep practicing and you really want to keep practicing more and more because if you can do it for your clients or even for your own personal work, right? Like if you look at people on Instagram and you're like, I wonder how the hell they did that image. Like by doing the same thing that we just did with the previous four images, you can break it down and do it yourself. So on the left-hand side is the Instagram um, images that I literally just screenshotted from Sophie Gamond. She specializes in studio portraiture of dogs because that's her thing. Her work is awesome. Like you guys should go check it out. She also stylizes really beautifully and like does all sorts of really cool stuff. Um, recently, I got asked to do a shoot for a Korean canine, which is a foster agency in Brooklyn, or no, sorry, Queens. Um, and they came to me and said, we really love Sophie's work. Is that something you know how to do? To which I was like, sure, I could figure it out. You know, like, let me think about the image, see if that's something that I can do with my equipment and let you know. And so the image on the right is kind of one of the final images that we kind of got to um, as a result. So when we look at that, and I'll kind of walk you through how I look at her images on the left, right? I, the first thing I look at is I look at her eyes, or not her eyes, the dog's eyes. And from the catch lights, you can tell that there's only one light source. And it's probably circular. Although it might, it might not be because by the time it gets to their eyes, it's tough to tell. 
Um, but there's one light source because there's only one catch light in the eye. There isn't a second light to fill in shadows. Um, looking at the shadows on the backdrops, how soft it is here, the dogs are either a far distance away from the paper or this light source is relatively large in relation to the dog. I suspect it's the latter because there aren't that many hard shadows across the rest of the dog's fur and the fur is very evenly lit, which makes me think that it's just one big light source that she's using to then point like right above the dogs and then feather the dog with very even light. Uh, and the reason I say that she's pointing it above the dog and not right at the dog is that if we look at the backdrop here on the left image, right, the, the top of the backdrop is brighter than the bottom of the backdrop, meaning that if we just closed our eyes and took a picture of the scene and the light, the light is actually firing somewhere here, right? And so therefore the dog is most kind of lit more than the rest of the, uh, of the body, but then the light starts to fall off as you get farther down off the paper. So that's, you know, basically what I did with them, right? So I brought one light to the setup, to the shoot, with a mod of, with like a, with a soft box that was roughly about, I think my soft box was about this big, right? So it was like a 24 by 24 soft box. Um, so big enough to light kind of the dog itself. They wanted something a little more dramatic. So I moved the light to be a little more off the side rather than right on top of them, creating these shadows on the left-hand side of the puppers um, and also creating that light fall off. If I had access to an even larger so uh, soft box, I probably would, would have used that just to even out these shadows. Um, but yeah, so, so this skill is something that like I do on a very regular basis. It's something that clients love if you're able to break down images or also like, you know, when you wanna work with them to create stuff, clients know they want this. They don't know you're gonna need X, Y, Z and like the gear list. So as photographers, that's our job. Our job is to translate their artistic direction into the technical whatever we need to know to create the image on the right hand side. Um, and the more you do this and the better you get at it, the, um, the easier it will become over time for you to create kind of the work that you wanna do. And, and that's basically how I approach all my shoots now, right? It's like, do I have an inspiration image? Those of you who are in our portrait workshop um, know that like I love to work off of inspiration images and this is why. It's because I look at the inspiration image and I say, okay, what was the gear that they might have used? Um, like how might they have used it? What are the sizes of the light sources? Um, so that I can then go recreate it and create the recipe for the image myself. Note that like what I haven't mentioned is like, I'm not asking what kind of camera Sophie uses. I'm not asking, well, right now I'm not asking what kind of lens she uses, right? I'm not asking like what brand of flash she uses because those things matter, but not nearly as much of, do you understand, you know, how she's controlling the light in her image? How are you controlling the light in your own images? And whether you're maximizing your ability to control light, um, it doesn't really matter if she used Godox or Profoto or just like a Nikon speed light um, or a strobe or like a continuous panel, you know, like it doesn't really matter nearly as much. But because I know a lot of people have questions about it, we'll talk a little bit about gear. So just a quick note about gear acquisition syndrome. My best piece of advice when it comes towards buying gear is to start cheap and build your way up. Um, what I mean by that is, is that it will be very, very easy to spend lots and lots of money on lighting and lighting equipment and lighting modifiers um, and like different flashes and to get really mired into like the details of what each thing can do. And ultimately you don't necessarily need all that. You know, you probably have a friend who has a, a speed light you can borrow. Um, you probably, if not, like if you're in New York and you need to borrow gear, like I have way too much. Um, you know, you, you wanna, it can get really expensive really quickly. And so I'm gonna make some recommendations on like cheap ways to get started about like incorporating flash, incorporating like lighting and ways to control the light in your scene. Um, but think about like, you know, mastering, for example, hard versus small or hard light versus soft light, big lights versus smaller light sources and, you know, or inverse square law, that doesn't really require gear for you to understand these rules and apply them. Even for those of you who are natural light shooters, right? Just properly understanding like what the sun is gonna do when it bounces off of buildings and how that's gonna impact the light in your scene. Thinking about that will definitely like upgrade your own photography. 
So the first thing that I recommend people buy is a reflector because they're super cheap. Uh, you can beat them up. You can even cut holes in them if you want to. And you can do a lot of really good work with it. Um, there are more like a number of photographers who I am sure do full careers with nothing but a reflector and their camera and like one lens. If anyone's familiar with like Danny Diamond on Instagram, um, he is known for basically shooting natural light all the time with just a big four by six foot reflector. Um, and again, I'll share the deck with you guys after this so that you guys don't have to just try to write down these things. Um, but reflectors are probably the first thing that I recommend uh, like photographers purchase. Um, I think you can get a 43 inch reflector for like $25, $30 um, and get the five in ones. Use the white side. I think that a lot of people, they'll start using the silver side, but the silver side can be really, really bright and you don't want to blind your models because it's basically like holding a mirror up to the sun with your model. So going back to this earlier shoot, right? Like a very common thing that I'll do is I'll put the sun behind them and I'll fill in with the reflector. But if you're using silver to do that, you're basically reflecting the sun into their eyes. Um, and that's not very nice. Strobes, okay, so we've mentioned a couple times, like so, you know, strobes, speed lights, flashes, LED lights, they all go by different names. They're all functionally the same thing, right? You either have things like this, which is a strobe, meaning, and what I mean by strobe is like it flashes. I don't know if you guys can actually see that or not, um, right? Continuous lights are like LED lights, are like the panels that I use to take pictures of the rings. Um, oh, great question, Christina. Am I holding the reflector and, and the camera at the same time or do I lean the reflector against something? So, depends. Um, if it's my 43 inch reflector, I'm usually just holding it in one hand and shooting with the other hand. Um, for those of you who are portrait photographers and you shoot in portrait a lot and your camera doesn't have a grip because you don't, you don't shoot with a grip, um, this is a trick that I picked up that you can do and y'all are gonna laugh, but it works. it works. But so if you imagine, right? Like I have my camera here, right? And I have my reflector that I'm holding basically with one hand um, and like trying to wrangle. And this works well if you have like the 43 inch disc because the 43 inch disc isn't too big that you start needing someone else to hold it for you. Um, when you get to the four foot by six foot, like really big reflector, that's big enough to basically bounce light onto their whole body rather than half their body. Um, you might start needing to like bring clips to clip it to like, things nearby, um, or you can like ask an assistant. So like eight clamps, um, I use eight clamps all the time. Let me see if I have one somewhere um, here. So like these like little eight clamps that you can buy from a hardware store costs like two bucks a clamp, five bucks a clamp. They're not very expensive, but you can use this to just basically clamp your, your uh, reflector to whatever you want. Um, oftentimes, for example, if I'm shooting in New York, there's like scaffolding everywhere you can just clamp it to scaffolding, right? Um, or you can clamp it to a pole or whatever. Um, other things you can do is, yeah, you can just bring a, bring a friend. Um, you can buy stands for this. I tend not to like stands because when you're shooting outside, there's this thing called wind and wind is a bitch and that will take your big reflector and blow it away. But yes, you can buy stands, they do exist. Um, but then once you start buying stands and then you want to, pre to prevent them from blowing away, you then start needing sandbags. And now you're like crossing that line of bringing 40, 50, 60 pounds of sand to a shoot. And that's not fun. Yes, wind is a bitch. <laughs> uh, well, especially because when you're like my big one, um, my four foot by six foot, which I'm not about to open, um, is it's, I mean, it's six feet tall, right? Like that's for, for, for me, it's like literally taller than I am. Uh, and yeah. So I, I love reflectors. I think there's a ton of work you can do with that. Um, for any of you natural light shooters who are kind of scared by flash um, and scared about incorporating artificial lighting, buy a reflector, start learning how to use a reflector. Um, I think that's a great way to get started with just manipulating light. Um, a pro tip around um, if you buy these like 43 inch disc reflectors is to cut a hole in the center um, because then you can stick your camera through it. Um, you can stick your camera through it and then also manipulate it and you create kind of like beauty dish-esque even lighting all around, uh, 
without it having to do that. And the reason you do that is because, so um, to answer your, you know, your earlier question, Christine, is that like when I'm shooting, right? So if I'm shooting, I'm shooting, I'm holding my reflector here. It's now like down here and reflecting light. And depending on the intensity of light, right? Because think back to inverse square law. My reflector is a lot co closer to my subject than the sun might be or where my main light source might be. So I might end up reflecting too much light onto them. And depending on what focal length I'm using, I might not have the option to soften it out. So you might end up with just shadows that like lighting that comes from like six o'clock, which isn't always the most like flattering. Um, it's like evil lighting is what comes from six o'clock, you know? Um, and so that's, that's why I cut a hole inside my, my disc reflector so that I can basically hold up my disc reflector and shoot through it and then manipulate the light and the direction of light um, like that. Um, yes, so, so, so this, shoot with, this shoot with Darlene was shot exactly like that. In fact, you know what, er, screw it, uh, let me see. Ah, I do have it. Okay, I'll show you. I'll show you exactly what I mean. I love that this is like turning into show and tell of all the gear that I've bought that is just way too expensive. Um, but yeah, so 43 inch re disc reflector. Um, I use the white side, and I cut a hole in the center. You guys can still hear me, right? Because the mic is attached to my ear. Um, so basically, what I do is I just stick my camera through it, and so now I can control the direction of the light, right? Depending on where the light source is coming from and the way it looks on them without being limited to, you know, being above and having to hold a reflector like way up here and I can't really get it. I can't get that high, right? Um, or like below, which is oftentimes what people will do. Cause this is a very common setup, right? Like holding the camera and shooting like this. Um, another tip for you guys who are pr uh, portrait photographers. So this is an issue that I ran into where, you know, you're shooting horizontally all the time. You're shooting horizontally all the time. Now you're shooting vertically and you don't always, you're not always able to hold your reflector in your left hand. Sometimes you want to hold the reflector in your right hand. So what you can do is by holding the barrel of your lens, right? By setting up your like stuff. And nowadays a lot of cameras have like IAF anyways, like I autofocus, or you can just set your focus point ahead of time, right? By using your index finger onto the um, shutter button, you can then shoot sideways like that. Sean, did I just blow your mind? <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, you know, if you imagine, if you shoot like aperture priority, which I very commonly do, um, yeah, so, so if you guys can all, I mean, I feel like this is turning into a very like, grab your, grab your cameras and, and, you know, get along with me here. But yeah, so, so I'll see if I can, like, this is basically how I will shoot a lot of portrait work with my left hand. So literally eye up, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Watching Sean's like reaction as he figures this out is just the funniest thing. All right, Dude, cool. Photography is truly an art. <laughs> um, anyone who said photography wasn't also physical, um, isn't a physical art, is just, you know, this is, this is part of it. But yeah, so that's reflectors. Um, back to strobe speed lights and flashes. Um, so my recommendation is that if you're interested in, you know, buying a flash, is to start cheap and buy what I'm gonna call minimally viable setups. Because when you're first starting out, all you need is manual control and some way to trigger your flash. If you're putting your flash onto your camera, right, you don't even need some way to trigger it. So common brands that you can look to um, are for really, really cheap stuff. Like when I was first starting out, I bought Yongnuo flashes. Uh, Nuir and Yongnuo are like basically two Chinese knockoff, like, camera brands, but you can buy like a flash for I think like $30, $40 now. Um, I don't remember the exact model numbers because it's been years since I've bought their products, um, but it'll get you started. All you need to look for is manual control and that's about it because I think that, again, when we're thinking about things like inverse square law, when we're thinking about um, controlling the light and how much light we're adding to our image, it's best to start with manual control. Um, nowadays, a lot of brands like the, the like Flashpoint like Godox, these are kind of mid-tier brands that are competing with the flagship Canon, Nikon, Sony brands and have a lot of features that kind of come into this. So, you know, if I bought like a Yongnuo flash, I would also need to buy some way to trigger it, which Cowboy Studio is another brand that I bought for starting out, like um, that will basically let you create those like trans, uh, transmitters and a c commander and they're like different products that you use to trigger your flash. Um, 
if this is making no sense to you, that's okay. Um, ask questions if this is something that people are interested in. I'm happy to dive more into it. Um, but I'm just trying to throw out, these are the brands to look for and the price points to look for, um, depending on what you want. If you're buying pro photo lights, you don't need me. In fact, buy them for me. I personally use Godox or Flashpoint. Flashpoint is basically Adorama's like third party, like Costco branding for Godox flashes. Um, but um, yeah. So these are some brands that you can look to and when you're trying to buy things for a minimally viable. So start off with manual flash when you're teaching yourself how to figure out like how to control light, how to like start thinking about, you know, adding light to a scene that isn't already there. Um, for features like TTL, high speed sync, TYG and PSL aren't actually anything. I was just kind of lampooning the fact that photography is full of jargon. Um, but like TTL is basically flash equivalent of like auto exposure where the flash will figure out how powerful it needs to be on its own. Um, I don't think you need TTL when you're first starting out. I think a lot of photographers, like I have met plenty of photographers who, because they started out using TTL right off the bat, um, which is again, basically auto exposure for your flash. Like they have no idea how to manage flash in their scene. So I actually think it's a disservice if you buy a flash that has more features than you need, go and then learn all these advanced features and never actually remember like how to do like manual flash. Um, high speed sync is basically for, um, this is another thing for flash. If this starts to get a little technical and this is not something people would, like care about, that's okay. But um, flashes have a limit over which they cannot fire quick enough to fill your entire scene. Oftentimes it's usually one over 200 shutter speed or one over, one over 250 shutter speed. So if you've ever had a flash and you're shooting your flash and you come up with like black bars across your image, that's probably because you've gone above the high speed sync speed or above the sync speed of the flash. Because if you imagine the flash fires at a certain, over a certain time period as well. Um, and so high speed sync is a specific feature that like flash manufacturers came up with to allow you to shoot at shutter speeds faster than one over 200 or one over 250. Um, that's more applicable if you're doing work like outdoors when you have a lot of light, right? Because maybe, you know, I wanna underexpose my ambient light, but if there's too much ambient light and I don't wanna change my aperture and my, my ISO is already at a minimum, the only way, the only thing left I have to change is my, expo uh, is my shutter speed. So those are the kinds of things that as you get more advanced, um, like buying more expensive gear that have more features that will come into use. Um, generally speaking, the more features, power, or like battery your gear has, or the more consistent the light is, um, you know, because there is like, even though I say that these are all daylight balanced, there are sometimes small color temperature shifts between individual pops of the flash. Uh, cheaper brands tend to have larger color shifts in the color temperature of the light. Uh, more expensive flashes, like this is why Profoto is so expensive, is because Profoto is very well known for having very, very, very consistent lighting, which if you're an event photographer, it doesn't really matter because your temperature is all over the place anyways, because you're dealing with multi-light setups. If you're just starting out and you're just starting to learn how to integrate flash, I don't think that's something you need to worry about either. But if you're like a pro photographer in a studio doing commercial work, like commercial product photography work, those start to become features that you care about. And that's why Profoto is so expensive. But when you're just starting out, don't worry about any of that. Cool. The next thing to talk about is like modifiers, is that if you start like buying off camera flashes, um, shaping your light with modifiers is gonna become a thing because you know while it can be nice, like a very common starting light setup is to just put this on a stick and point it at a wall to bounce light onto your subject. But that doesn't always give you the most control over how the light is being emitted from your flash. So my best recommendation for how to think about which modifiers you wanna buy and spend money on it's the same thing, right? Like there's the really cheap stuff that you can buy that's like the fast fashion of like photography where you use it twice and it might break, but you at least get to use it. Or you can like buy the really, really expensive stuff that'll last you a lifetime. But like realistically, if you're not gonna, if you're only using it for one or two shoots, you don't necessarily need that. Um, and here are some kind of common trade-offs between umbrellas, soft boxes, and beauty dishes. But honestly, like this is more than I have the knowledge for. And this is something that literally when I'm buying a new modifier, I just go to YouTube. And like, this is, I think the first six videos that come up whenever I Googled like lighting modifier comparison and you'll get to see how it changes the light um, and the methodology that other photographers use in terms of figuring out what you wanna buy. 
cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, any other questions or anything like that? So now I was just going to jump into a couple different topics that I've heard people ask about in the survey that you guys filled out before um, when you guys signed up for the um, workshop. So the first question that was pretty common was how to deal with like harsh or unflattering light. Um, the most common scenario that I see for harsh light is like shooting at noon in bright sunlight, to which I say, just don't shoot at noon. Like an easy way to wait, if you have the time flexibility, like don't schedule shoots at noon because the light just doesn't look good. Um, if you're stuck and you have to shoot at noon, maybe look for areas of open shadow, right? Like maybe there's some place where there's an overhang um, that you can shoot under or like the shadow of a building if it's later in the day, because that'll give you opportunities. So for example, this image on the left, we shot, I think it was like midday at like 2 p.m. And I didn't want to use the sun. So we just shot next to a building that had a slight shadow, um, which created much softer light for us to use. Uh, another posing tip that I often use when dealing with uh, harsh or unflattering light is to have my subject point their nose at the light. Um, because if I'm going to create a hard shadow on my subject, I would rather the hard, the hard shadow just goes under their jaw, which can sometimes be nice if they have good bone structure and it actually accentuates their jaw. Um, but what I don't want to happen is I don't want the light to come from the side, hit their nose, and just create a really unsightly shadow right across their face. Or I'll pull out my reflector and put the sun behind them and fill with a reflector. So like this was a campaign that I did. Like this was some yoga active wear brand that wanted me to shoot for them. But the only time that they were able to do it is we had to start at like noon. And I was like, okay, uh, in the California sun. And there was nothing to diffuse with anything. And I was in California and I basically didn't have any of my gear that's like here in New York. So I went and bought like a single reflector, brought it onto the shoot and use it to shoot this image. Um, cool. Moving on, um, discussing kind of lighting setups. This was something that also people asked about in terms of how to create flattering light um, or flattering portrait light. Um, you'll hear the term Rembrandt lighting thrown around. Um, there is a history to it. I'm not an art history major. Um, I am not familiar with the history around it, but basically, it's based off of a painting technique because Rembrandt was very well known for creating portraits um, that had lighting that came from 45 degrees off center and pointing down at his subject, or at least painting his subjects to look like that. And so it creates this loop where you have the dark side of the nose and the dark side of the cheekbone, and it helps define the face, helps them look engaged, helps them, um, and helps create a little bit of drama into your scene. So you can do it. This was, I would say, a little bit less. You can do a little harder, where I even have like a very hard drop off right here. Or you can fill in the shadow a little bit with like a reflector and get light like that. So that's like one really common lighting setup for those of you that you can do this with one light. Um, so for those of you who are foraying into off camera flash, um, this would be one that I would recommend you try and learn how to do um, because it looks good and it, it just, it works. For those of you who are interested in TikTok or beauty photography, a very common lighting setup is called clamshell, where you have two light sources, one above and one below. So if you look at my model's face here, you can see there's two catch lights, not one. So there's one light up here, and I think it was a reflector on the bottom. I don't remember if it was a reflector or if it was a flash. Um, but then it's used very commonly in beauty editorial work, um, where you create this very bright, flattering look this is also why, like for those of you who have like vanity mirrors, they usually have light all around, right? Um, so that it evenly lights your face and you can actually see what you're doing when you're putting on makeup. This is something that I suspect that girls are more familiar with than the guys. Um, but clamshell lighting can be above and below. It can be left and right, however you want to do it. So that's another very common lighting setup. This is why like everyone's buying ring lights for TikTok because you put your camera here and the ring light is all around you. So you get even lighting that's generally larger than your face. So you get even lighting on your face. All right, so back to being a little physics-y. Uh, some people asked about lighting for different skin tones. 
Um, and that reminded me of this idea of when you're working with artificial light, that like physics 101, um, the light that we're seeing is because of light bouncing off of our subjects and entering the camera. So if certain wavelengths of light aren't available in the scene, what? Oh, um, if, we, if there isn't wavelengths of light available in the scene, then your camera will not be able to capture it. So this is something for those of you who shoot with artificial lighting, for those of you who like to shoot at night, something for you to consider, that some light sources do not emit the full color spectrum of visible light. So on the left is the wavelengths emitted by incandescent light, and on the right is wavelengths emitted by fluorescent light tubes. And you can see that while both of them to our eye will emit white light, the actual wavelengths emitted do not necessarily cover the full, um, the full color spectrum. Why does this matter? So it matters because our skin is not one color, right? Our skin has a lot of different color tones blended together to create the skin tones. So if you're using a lighting source that doesn't emit the full color wavelengths, you can sometimes end up with weird colors on the skin because you're not getting the full spectrum of color reflected back from the skin. So for those of you who do event photography, for those of you who are shooting at night um, with like neon lighting, if anyone's ever done like a neon light shoot with fluorescent like lighting, I think that's very common in New York, like street style neon shoots. And afterwards in Lightroom, you start moving the colors around um, by adjusting your color temperature. You may notice that you will have limits to how much you can actually change the colors. And the reason for that is because neon doesn't emit every color spectrum. In fact, by definition, neon only emits whatever color the gas is. So that's something to think about. The way you can get around this, and this is what I do whenever I'm at a wedding, is by popping a flash, because I know that my flash will emit the full color spectrum of visible light, or at least a consistent color spectrum of visible light. Um, and therefore, sorry, is there? Is there okay, cool. Um, and therefore, I can know that I can supplement whatever light is available in the scene, um, even if you know the, the light the ambient light isn't emitting a full color spectrum. I've mentioned this a few times about bounce flash. Um, this is basically a picture of me and how I shoot 95% of my weddings. Um, I generally don't do too much off-camera flash anymore, but for those of you who are interested in event work and you're trying to figure out how do you just get into it, um, learning how to bounce your flash is, is a pretty crucial skill. Um, the only thing to keep in mind is that you will pick up the colors of whatever surface you bounce off of. So if I'm pointing it up at the ceiling and the ceiling is all wooden rafters, then my images will come out a little more orange. So I have to make sure to counter that in post-production or gel my flash to match, to change the colors properly. For those of you who are interested in kind of a more technical explanation of off-camera flash, I would recommend you check out this guy, David Hobby. Um, he does have gear recommendations, which I think are a little outdated, but he has a lot of great information about as you want to start inco incorporating off-camera flash. Him and Joe McNally are probably the two like off-camera flash strobe like people um, that are very well known for it. In any case, it's now, wow, it's 518, Jesus. Um, so it's 518, and we've talked about a lot of different topics um, covering a very wide range of different things in lighting, and this is by no means comprehensive. Um, but I did want to leave room at the bottom for any kind of Q&A um, that you guys may have. Um, you know, thank you guys so much for coming. This is a pretty, um, this is obviously, this is a topic that I really like talking about and I really like thinking about. Um, but obviously when we were planning this workshop, we weren't sure how many people would also be willing to hear me ramble about photography for a couple hours. Um, but I hope that you guys learned something. Um, shameless plug, here's my socials, here's my website. Um, that's the ACN PayPal. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to stick around for as long as we need. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out if you guys have questions. Um, if you guys are thinking about what kind of gear to buy, um, stuff like that, like please, again, don't hesitate to like ask. Um, I'm just gonna chill out in the, in the channel now, but um, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, really didn't expect to have like the number of people responding a as we did. And so I was really glad, I was worried it'd be like me and like two other people. Um, so for all of you guys who you know decided to spend an hour 
um, you know, especially for those of you who had to wake up super early or whatever, like really appreciate it. It means a lot. Uh, I, I hope everyone learned something helpful here. Um, if you guys have questions, I'm more than happy to stick around. If you guys want to like recap on certain topics that we've covered here, uh, more than happy to stick around. But otherwise, like that's all the information that I had prepared for um, today's workshop. If you have ideas for future workshops, let me know. Um, let like, you know, DM me or, or shoot the ACN page a message as well. Uh, we are always trying to think of like what next workshop to do. Um, you know, I might, uh, the other Justin who was on the ACN account was talking about doing like a photography 101, like how to understand the exposure triangle and like that might have been cool. Um, yeah, if you have, if you want to host a workshop, like if someone wants to teach landscape photography, I want to learn because Landscape photography, I, again, know nothing about and don't do very much of. Um, lighting setups, diagrams, and examples. Okay, yeah. Um, is, there, is there a lighting setup that you want to go over? 